So what I wanted to do for the, the rest of the time, uh, almost 20 minutes uh, that we have in this session is I'm gonna start sharing my screen again. Um, and uh, I'll be, there's my email. If you guys wanna read my email. Um, I'll be in the, the manual um, for a bit. And this is page three, just to kind of recall you know, vision, mission, and values. We, we talked about the vision last night um, to see the city of Seattle become more and more like the city of God. You know, very big, overarching uh, kind of stuff. And then as you go down, the mission becomes a bit more concrete. And I'll read the four aspects of the mission statement. Um, you know, how do we prioritize our time, energy, and effort? The first one, abiding with God. Um, and... Uh, you know, um, and, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, what does it mean to live with him? Uh, then loving our neighbors um, and working for the common good. Uh, Jason will be talking about um, working for the common good, which one way to understand that is is a is a way to apply loving our neighbors. Uh, you know, the great commandment: love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love love your neighbor as yourself, and part of that means we believe having a an open outward face towards the city and laboring for the city's good um and then lastly uh, bearing witness to uh god's transforming love um so the the first one there uh abiding with god um you know at root the uh the christian life is about life with god god sharing his life with us giving it to us through Jesus, and then us receiving that life, not so that, you know, we can be forgiven and go to heaven when we die, though those, though those things are true, but really, we may be brought into his life, uh, the life of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so that that really is the, the core of the Christian life, um, is to live with the Lord on, uh, really on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, on a, a uh, relational um, kind of both head and heart. Maybe that's one way to categorize what I want to talk about this morning is our approach is we want to nurture people uh, both in our heads. Um, and, and, and a lot of you, myself included, have talked about, you know, the freedom that you have found in um, kind of a reformed understanding uh, of the scriptures. Um, what, what does it mean that God uh, is gracious and we're saved by faith alone in Christ alone? Um, those those types of things. Um, uh, but then also nurturing the heart. How do we how do we uh, draw people into a day by day, uh, week by week, month by month uh, relationship with Him? Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna share again. Again, I'll I'll toggle between sharing and not sharing just because I don't want you to be bored looking at. Um, uh, the manual all the time. Okay, there's. Uh, all right. So, would somebody would somebody read this? This is Revelation twenty one two and three, and this is the vision of uh, of the holy city, the the city of God, if you will. Um, that I believe Jesus, when he came the first time, he he began to establish the city, and we're it's growing now um, in us and around us and all throughout the world, throughout history, but we're also looking forward to the final fulfillment of that. Can, can somebody, would somebody be so bold as to read that? I'll read it. Uh, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband and i heard a loud voice from the throne saying look god's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them they will be his people and god himself will be with them and be their god thank you marco Yeah, so as, as that scripture um, speaks about, 
you know, you read Revelation 21, 22, um, and, you know, it begins to describe the city of God, um, which, again, I don't think is just future. I think Jesus came to inaugurate it and begin building it when he came the first time. Um, one of the major features there is God is there and God is dwelling with his people there. Um, and, you know, later in that chapter, it says they, they, they won't need a light anymore uh, because the lamb, uh, Jesus, will be our light. So it's this this dwelling with him closely so that his very presence is is the thing that lights our path. Um, that uh, those two chapters also speak of the church as the bride of Christ and Christ as the groom. So, again, this intimate uh, relationship uh, uh mutual some some theologians call it mutual indwelling uh is is what this relationship of the trinity is all about but we're invited into that and now we we dwell with christ and as we are intimately walking with him he he bears fruit into the world um so i, I believe it should be a a, a critical uh, feature of our lives now not a, not a perfect feature this is not about you know you having the 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 most mountaintop devotional experiences uh, every single day of your life. It's not a contest in that sort of way, but it is a very real uh, relationship uh, of walking. Um, so what we, I'm gonna start sharing again. Uh, so the, the, the two sort of streams that we're pulling heavily from are first, and some of y'all have already talked about this, So uh, it is the, the Reformation, uh, the Reformation in Europe in um, the 1500s and 1600s and following, where in, in many ways they were asking the question, you know, how, how do we enter into a relationship with God? Is it about being good Christians, faithful Christians, working hard, trying hard? Um, and one of the messages of the Reformation was, was no, salvation is a gift of god's grace so how we're made right with the world but also how the world is put back together is a gift of, of god's grace um and then the reformation uh because everybody wrote in latin uh, back then at least it was kind of the theological um language of uh of europe at the time um uh, a lot of these slogans were in latin so the first one that I'll talk about, I won't talk about the other ones, but sola gratia, by grace alone. Um, a relationship with God is the is is a, a gift, a, is a sheer gift of, or is a gift of his sheer grace. Um, uh, I don't edit that well. Uh, it is a gift that he gives to the undeserving. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is why Martin Luther, one of the uh, Protestant reformers, was able to say, simul justus et peccator, simul, like simultaneously, at the same time, just, justified, or made right with the Lord and sinner. Um, so if you know anything about Luther's life, he was a monk, and he, uh, he worked so hard to be righteous enough for God to love him. There was this one moment where he was um, walking up the, the, these bell tower stairs, um, uh, on his knees, um, saying the Lord's prayer on every step. Uh, so he was, I mean, you talk about a guy who was sold out for the Lord, that was him. And he, and he found that he just couldn't find rest that way. Um, and then he began to discover, no, salvation is a free gift uh, of the Lord, um, a, a free gift of his grace. Um, so that's one thing that, that we as a church really try to emphasize uh, uh grace is the the shorthand name for our church um you know our full name is grace church seattle but if you want to use one word the word you would use is grace um and that's really on purpose um that we we really believe that salvation is a gift of the lord so everything that we do from preaching to our community life um is built upon this, um, and we hope that you know that that you have experienced some of this. It's weird because of the pandemic, especially those of you who are new to the church and only know pandemic grace. Um, 
but uh, hopefully what you've experienced and if you've experienced the community at all, you've experienced this great freedom that, hey, it is okay to be broken, to be a mess, uh, to be sinful. Uh, we're very much a, a, a process oriented group where uh, we're, we're interested in entering into the mess with folks and uh, where is God taking you versus a, you've got to show up as a finished product um, uh, at grace. And, and this comes from the, the theology of the Reformation we, we celebrate and uh, build, build everything on. So um, that, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. Um, hopefully you've seen this reflected in the way that we worship, uh, the way that Jason and I preach, uh, the classes we have, the small groups, uh, and so forth. So that, that's kind of uh, the, the first major piece of this. And I'll, I'll summarize with this. I'm going to share my screen again. This is, uh, during the Reformation, a lot of uh, documents were written um, to explain this faith. Uh, what, what do we believe in uh, lots of uh, uh, statements of faith and lots of catechisms. And a catechism is just a question and answer teaching tool. And this is one of my favorites. This is from the Heidelberg uh, Catechism. And Luther may have had a hand in helping write this. But um, so can somebody read that? It's just the question, what is your only comfort in life and death? And then the, the couple sentences right underneath that. It's, it's, re it's really beautiful. Yeah, I can. Um, that I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. All right. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, that's just such a beautiful, um, a, a beautiful uh, uh, catechism. A lot, a lot of times catechism questions can be sort of like 35,000 feet, like, you know, what's God like? And there's all these great true things, but this, the Heidelberg is really kind of one of the most uh, almost prayerful, like experiential sorts of catechism, which your only comfort in life and death. So it's, it's very much spoken to people who are on the pathway of discipleship but struggling uh, quite a bit. But it's, it's a really beautiful encapsulation of the grace of God. Um, so th that's really the first piece of this. And, and, and again, you could maybe to oversimplify, you could you could say that this is uh, our approach uh, is, is about the head. What, what, what are we learning? Uh, what do the scriptures teach and so forth? But we don't, we don't wanna stop there. Uh, we, we really want to be uh, transformed uh, folks. And then if you'll notice, uh, I'm gonna skip here to page nine. Um, we have practices, rhythms, and structures. Um, and, and these things are basically, how do we structure our time? What kind of congregational events are important? Do we emphasize and that sort of thing? Because we believe that um, God doesn't just work through uh, our brains, but he works through our bodies and our practices, and the things that we do. Um, and so uh, a, a big part of what we do is Sunday worship. Um, uh, that's really, um, it's, not the, it's not the only thing that we do, but it, it is really uh, just a pivotal event uh, that we have. Every week we're being shaped and formed uh, and being, you know, reminded of the gospel, but also hopefully experiencing that gospel on a regular basis. Uh, and even in pandemic, you know, Zoom land, YouTube land, um, believing that the spirit of God is still there. Uh, still at work. We long for the day when we can return uh, to be with one another, uh, but uh, Sunday worship is a, is a big part of the life of the body. And then the, the, the second piece of this, um, let me start sharing my screen here. Uh, there we go. Uh, the second piece that you could, uh, you could maybe call the heart 
um, again, and I'm, I'm not saying studying theology doesn't involve your heart, uh, but really we, I have found, we have found that um, the reformed tradition has great strengths in theological, uh, uh, great theological gifts and strengths. Uh, but as far as like this practical day-to-day -day communion with God, how is God at work in my life? How might he be leading me, prompting me and so forth? Uh, we've found that we've had to go uh, to other traditions uh, within the within uh, the Christian world, uh, particularly uh, Anglican, Episcopal, and even some Catholic uh, uh, streams here. Um, so, and, and here I just want to talk briefly about uh, a concept called a rule of life. Um, and I don't know, um, uh, I'll, I'll just stop sharing for just a second. Uh, if you've heard of rule of life, uh, could you give a thumbs up uh, either on the screen or, um, uh, or otherwise you can do the little thumbs up emoji or just give a thumbs up like that. If you've heard of it, uh, thumbs up. Okay. I think one one person is what I thought. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, a rule a rule of life is something that I've become a big believer in. And um, again, based on it, based on your tradition, you know, maybe you were at a tradition that really sort of prioritized quiet time and stuff like that, and you found it not necessarily life giving because it it became this sort of treadmill of you know, I got to do my quiet time or God doesn't love me. Um, uh, that, that, that's not my story, but it, it, may be, it may be your story. But a rule of life is basically about taking ownership of your spiritual life and saying, I want to prioritize uh, time with God, uh, time in prayer, uh, time in reading scripture, time with other Christians, um, and so forth. And the rule of life draws from all the way back to the seventh century. There was a guy named Benedict who was a monk and he um, wanted to, he, he, he basically realized that, hey, the life of the clergy um, was kind of a wreck and um, they, they weren't really living up to who they claimed to be and what they were teaching and what the church was advocating for. So he developed a community, a monastery um, kind of patterned after the desert uh, fathers and mothers in the third and fourth century uh, of how do we intentionally structure our days so that we're spending time with the Lord, time in solitude, Sabbath, uh, and so forth. Now, his his rule of life were there were seven periods a day of uh, prayer, uh, so that was that was quite a bit. Um, so in in each time of prayer, you were praying, but you were also reading scripture. Uh, praying through the Psalms, singing through the Psalms, uh, and so forth. Um, so uh, his rule of life was was pretty famous, but um, it uh, it was kind of unattainable unless you were a monk. Um, so during the Reformation, um, uh, one of the one of the offshoots of the Reformation in Europe was the Church of England, the Anglican tradition, and what they did through a guy named Thomas Cramner is he took that seven times of prayer a day and uh, simplified it to morning and evening prayer. So it's like, okay, if you're a monk, you can do seven times a day. If you're a lay person, you can't do seven times a day. How about morning and evening prayer? How about, how about twice a day? Um, so, so again, not that, you know, the Anglican morning and evening prayer is the magic bullet here, but again, the, the big idea is uh, structuring um, uh, your life in a way to spend time with the Lord. And I, and I have found that when we create time for the Lord, he, he loves being with us, so he will fill that time with his presence. So you don't have to be praying three hours a day. You know, maybe maybe you can do five minutes, maybe you can do 10 minutes. Start where you can, uh, be intentional. Um, uh, so uh, th there's a quote there at the bottom of page 12 that I'll read. Um, and uh, this is by Pete and Jerry Scazzaro. Pete's a pastor in New York City of a, I think a non-denominational church. And they have written and taught pretty extensively on this. So I, I would recommend um, his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Uh, it's one of the resources we have there. Um, 
he says a rule of life, or they say a rule of life is a structure or rhythm for our lives that enables us to pay attention to God in everything we do. It serves our desire to abide in and experience his love all day long, not compartmentalizing our spirituality. Our goal is to live our lives in communion with Jesus. That is to pray without ceasing. Awareness, attentiveness to him in all we do is our goal. All of us have a rule of life, but it is mostly unconscious. So he says, you know, regardless if you say, oh, no, I don't have a, I don't want to be very legalistic and structure a pattern that way. He's like, we all, we all have it, um, uh, but most of the time it's not stated. Uh, the purpose of crafting a conscious rule of life is to more effectively structure our time in order to be open to God in all the aspects of our lives. And they use the metaphor of a, uh, shoot, there we go. They use a metaphor of a trellis, and this is a, a great, ah, crap, uh, uh, this is a, a, a grape vineyard. Uh, these are great vines growing there, and uh, the trellis is the is the woodwork that and the and the the, the wood and the the, ca the metal cables there that support the growth of the vines. Um, and that's a, a good way of thinking about a rule of life. It's a structure that creates structure and space for life to grow in that structure and space. Um, with without it, yeah, the the vines would still grow, but they'd be laying on the ground. And they, they would be far less fruitful uh, than they than they would be otherwise. Um, so that that's really the the emphasis of the um, uh, the rule of life. And uh, you, you know we we we've put together a, a Lent booklet. Some of you may be using it. If you're not, I would encourage you to to consider start using it. And one of the purposes for that is one well one we wanted to have. Uh, daily activity that we could kind of gather people around together, even as we're so dispersed right now, but also get people into the habit of, you know, daily setting aside time for the Lord. Um, uh, so it's really kind of a, a, a rule of life sort of instinct is going through that. Um, I've, I've developed a conscious rule probably over the last five to seven years of, of morning prayer. Um, I still haven't graduated to morning and evening prayer. I'm more of a morning prayer person. Uh, at some point, when I perhaps when I get more spiritual, <laughs> I'll be able to regularly pray at night. But um, uh, normally, I just kind of collapse into bed at night. Um, uh, but there, there are great resources that we can make uh, available to you and can encourage you in this way. Um, so that, that, that's that's basically what I wanted to uh, to talk about today. Is 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 a big thing of what we're doing is we're trying to uh, create a space in our church through our teaching, uh, through our theolo theologically informed way of doing ministry, uh, and also with things like teaching people how to pray and how to develop time in a, in a, in a more personal communion with the Lord. It, it's really about abiding with him. What, it, what does it mean for us to abide with the God of all grace? Um, so that, that's what I wanted to share and impart. Um, I don't know if there are, there are questions or comments. There will also be time at the end for your questions and comments as well. Um, so I'll, I'll open it up for maybe a question or two now. Then we can pause and, and take a break. And then uh, Pastor Jason can come back 